In this video, I'm going to introduce you to proportional reasoning. Here's an example to let you get the idea of it. So a caterer makes a special punch using fresh juices. Here's how the ingredients are mixed for a standard regular batch. So they do half gallon of apple juice, quarter gallon of pineapple, eighth of a gallon of pomegranate, eighth of a gallon of grape juice. However, sometimes they need to make more. So for this big batch, the caterer started with 1.5 gallons of apple juice. And the question is, is how much of all the other juices do we need to add so the punch tastes normal? Now the wrong way to think about this, this is the incorrect approach, this is not proportional reasoning, is to say, well, we started with the original half gallon, and now there's 1.5, so that's one extra gallon than normal. And so the wrong way is to say, oh, I just need to add a gallon of everything else. So I need a gallon more of pineapple, a gallon more of pomegranate, and a gallon more of grape juice. Now that is incorrect. Because if you did that, the proportion or the percentage or the fraction of, let's say, grape juice in the original versus the grape juice in the incorrect batch they would, they would make would not be the same. You'd actually have more grape juice as a total fraction of the juice. So the correct way to do this, the right way, is to use proportional reasoning. So you need to think about it this way. They tripled the amount of apple juice going from a half gallon to 1.5 gallons. So we also need to triple everything else. So we're not adding a specific amount, but we're changing it by a factor. And in this case, the factor is three. So everything is going, all the proportions will be stay the same. So the ratio between any of these numbers in the original recipe will be the same as the ratio between any of these numbers in the big batch. So I just need to triple all the numbers up here. So that's gonna give me three fourths for, uh, for, of a gallon for pineapple juice, three eighths and three eighths for the other two. So that's the idea behind it. It's by what factor did a variable change? And then I need to change those other variables proportionally. These are all linear relationships. We're gonna see some nonlinear relationships in example number two. So let's do some proportional reasoning with equations. We're gonna use the Kinemax equations, but you will be doing uh, proportional reasoning with all the equations we develop this year in physics. So the first example, you have a cart on a ramp. It's at the top of the ramp. It's not moving. And when you release it from rest, it has an acceleration, A, and it rolls down the ramp for some time, T. Now we're not telling you those values. You don't have specific values for that. But now what you're gonna do is you're gonna increase the uh, steepness of the ramp, so now the acceleration is double what it was before. We actually don't know what the acceleration was, or is, we just know it's double what it was before. And I wanna know what is the speed of the car on the steep ramp after rolling the same time t. So we let it roll for the same time t, and now how fast will it be going now that it has double the acceleration? So we need to identify the givens in order to identify and choose which equation we need to use. So A doubles, it's the same time. It starts from rest. We're trying to find out how is the final velocity affected. And we don't care and we don't need the displacement. So let's go through our options for our kinematic equations. So this equation comes from the velocity versus time graph. It's just the equation of the line of that graph. This equation here is, uh, we can think of it in two different ways. This is the equation that describes the curve on a position versus time graph of an accelerated object. It's the, an equation of a parabola. Or it's the equation that you get when you find the area under a velocity versus time graph when you take the area of the rectangle plus the area of the triangle is the easiest way to develop this equation. This equation comes from our velocity versus position graph. When we linearize that, we got a v squared versus position. That's where that equation comes from. This equation here, several ways to think about this. This is the area under a velocity versus time graph. If you use the trapezoid formula, this equation looks very much like a trapezoid formula. This equation is also a con is an average velocity equation. If we were to divide both sides by time, we would get delta x divided by t. So displacement over time, that's the average velocity for an object. Well, the average velocity for an object can also be calculated taking the final velocity plus the initial velocity and divided by two or multiplied by a half. And that's for a constantly accelerating object, an object with a constant acceleration. And then our last equation. Now, um, some of you in, uh, you may not have seen these last two, depending on uh, what your teacher shows you. These are the three that are on the equation sheet. These are kind of extra.
Uh, this last equation here comes from the area under a velocity versus time graph. If you take a big rectangle and then you subtract off the triangle on top of it to find the displacement. Anyway, those are our five equations we need to, uh, to decide which one to choose. So the key is we don't know and we don't care and we don't need delta x. So those four equations have delta x in them, so we're going to cross those four off. And this is the equation we're going to use for our proportional reasoning. So the next thing we're going to do is a little bit different than what we do when we're solving typical problems. I'm actually going to rewrite the equation with blanks in front of each variable. And in front of the uh, variable, what I'm going to put here is the factor of change that um, needs to be applied to that variable given my uh, the information of the problem. So acceleration doubles, so I'm just going to put a 2. So all I'm saying is 2 times the original acceleration. I've doubled the original acceleration. At the same time, so that's a 1, because 1 times t is just t. It starts from rest, so I'm going to cross this off. One note with proportional reasoning, it does not work to do proportional reasoning with equations like this if you have a plus or minus sign in there. So you should look for something to be 0, so the um, added or subtracted term on the end drops out. If this initial velocity was not 0, we could not do proportional reasoning. And I'm going to put a question mark in front of the velocity there. This is the one time when solving equations I put a question mark rather than a variable because we already have these variables in here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the things I wrote in red and just write my own equation with them. One way to think about this is this is an equal sign. So I'm saying this is an equality. Left-hand side equals the right-hand side. And now I went in there and messed with it. I threw a bunch of numbers. I put a 2 in front of this one, a 1 in front of this one. You can't just mess with an equation. You have to keep both sides equal. So what I need to look at is by what factor did the right-hand side change, and I need to make sure the left-hand side is changing by the same factor. This one's pretty straightforward. You've already figured it out, I'm sure. And the final velocity is doubled. So if I double the final velocity, or if I double the acceleration for the same time, my final velocity will end up doubling. And then if I put a 2 here, these equations, it would be a, a, an equation, a true equation, again, a true equality. Let's do example two. Now the acceleration is doubled and the time the cart is allowed to roll down the ramp is also doubled. What's the new displacement of the cart? So now I'm looking for kind of how far the cart is going. I have two variables changing. So here are my givens. Acceleration doubles, time doubles, starts from rest. How is the displacement effect is what I want to find out. And I don't care and I don't need final velocity. So again, let's look at our equations. And if I don't care, don't need final velocity, Anything with the V in here, not going to not gonna use that. So I'm going to cross all of them out, except the one that doesn't have final velocity, this one right here. So this is what I'm going to use. We want to note that we it starts from rest, and we have a plus sign here, so that's got to disappear. Because initial velocity is 0, so 0 times any time that we put in there would always be 0, so we drop that out. Now I'm going to write my blanks. Notice there's a few things that's different here. I put parentheses around this side just to make it a little bit more organized because this is a little bit more complicated with three things plus a square. Also, I did one for the one half. A um, couple ways you could do this. This one half is a constant that'll never ever change. Some people just ignore this completely and don't even write the one half here. Um, what I find is when people do that is sometimes they'll end up writing the one half and then they end up multiplying it in and they mess everything up. So I leave it in there and I'm going to put in the factor of change for the one half. So my acceleration doubles, my time doubles. Now notice the parentheses here. The squared is outside the parentheses and that's very, very important. Um, because we're squaring this entire term here and I'll show you on the next slide what goes wrong when you when you don't square that entire term. Now what happens to the one half? Well that one half is still just one half so it's changed by a factor of one. One times one half is just one half. I'm not changing it all so I'm just going to put a one there. And then I want to know what happens to the delta x. So I'm just going to pull my equation down here. You can usually just do this in your head. One times two times two squared. Don't forget about this square. This is where everyone messes it up. And so now I know that it is 8 times the displacement. So if I double the acceleration of the object and let it roll for double the time, 
it's not going to go twice as far. It's not even going to go four times as far. It's going to go eight times as far. And that's because of this squared in here. That's a nonlinear relationship. So you've got to be really careful about those squares. Also, you need to watch out for multiple variables changing. Sometimes it won't be explicit that the acceleration doubled or that the time doubled or something doubled. And you'll have to realize, oh, that must have been doubling as well. Um, you'll see some examples of that later. All right. So I mentioned that it's, these parentheses are important. Here's why. So if I do it this way and this way, it looks kind of the same, but it's very, very different. It's not. You'll get really, really wrong answers. So let's make up a number for time to illustrate this. So let's say this, the time was five seconds. So we'll put a five in there, and then we're just going to calculate it out. So with my order of operations, I need to do the things inside the parentheses first. So I'm going to do two times five is ten. And then on this one here, i got to do the exponents first because there's no parentheses. So I'm going to get 10 squared first, 2 times, well, 5 squared is 25. So 2 times 25. 10 squared is 100, and 2 times 25 is 50. These are not the same. Obviously, they are not equal at all. So when you square something, you have to square this factor of change um, if the variable is squared because we're changing the amount of that variable. So whatever that new value is, that needs to be squared. All right, that's how to do proportional reasoning.